This week on Hometown Ghost Stories. A popular tourist destination for thousands of people every year, most come and go without realizing just how haunted Key West really is. From the old Key West lighthouse, haunted by its former keeper, to the ghosts of infamous pirates, the island is swarming with lost souls. But perhaps the most peculiar tale is that of the dead women who sleep beneath the floor of a popular saloon in the heart of the haunted city of Key West. Hometown Ghost Stories contains serious and often distressing events and is not intended for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Key West, Florida, 1980. I felt like I was transforming into something unnatural, a creature of the night. Honestly, I was just exhausted. We'd taken a job renovating a local restaurant, but we had to do it at night because the owner didn't want to sacrifice any revenue by closing during the project. So we worked overnight. I was fine with it at first, but sleeping during the day and working overnight was beginning to take a toll on my sanity. I was hearing things. Seeing things that weren't really there. The other night, I thought I saw somebody's shadow sleeping on the floor by the window. It looked so real, but when I approached, it faded into the darkness. It's hard to explain. You kind of have to be there. Tonight wasn't anything out of the ordinary. My default state was three quarters conscious at all times. The human body never really adapts to a nocturnal lifestyle. We're just not wired that way. Scott called out sick, so I was by myself tonight. He apparently was also having a tough time adapting to the unnatural sleep schedule. This restaurant was pretty unique, I had to admit. There was a real live tree growing in the middle of the bar room. I couldn't honestly say I'd ever seen that before. Sure, I'd seen buildings with fake trees and even smaller potted trees, but never a giant tree rooted to the ground through the floor and towering up through the roof of the building. That was indeed a first for me. I flipped the lights on and walked past the tree into the back area that we were renovating. It was a storage area that was being converted into a billiards room for pool tables and darts. The existing floor was just old subfloor boarding that was going to be pulled up. We were supposed to do that tonight, but I wasn't going to go at it by myself, so it would have to wait until tomorrow. Tonight, I would just button up a few smaller tasks that were unfinished from earlier in the week. I had been working for about an hour when I first heard it, a faint muffled cry coming from behind me. I turned around and saw nothing, so I assumed it was just my exhaustion manipulating my senses and went back to work. A minute or so went by when I heard it again, a little louder this time. I stopped, but didn't turn around, just waited, focusing so when it happened again I could identify it. The building was completely silent except for the ticking of a clock. Just then, the light began flickering accompanied by that eerie sound again. It was a cry, louder and more clear now. I whirled around and again found myself alone in the building. The crying was growing louder, so I walked towards where I thought it was coming from. I stopped when it was at its loudest. It was coming from beneath the floor. My blood turned to ice as the crying turned to a wail. It was a woman's voice, but there was no basement below the floor so whatever was making that sound couldn't be real. I squeezed my eyes shut and covered my ears, willing the sound to stop. My palms were pressed so hard to my head that all I could hear was my heart pounding in my ears. After a few moments, I let go and opened my eyes. I was alone in the building, and the sound had stopped. I decided to call it a night. I'd go home, and tomorrow night, we'd open up that floor and see what lies beneath. I'm Dave Wilkins, and this is Hometown Ghost Stories, Key West, Florida. Key West is an island in the Straits of Florida. 
The island is about four miles long and one mile wide, and is the southernmost city in the contiguous United States. Long before the Florida Keys were explored and colonized by the Spanish, the islands were first home to several tribes of Native Americans. It's believed that the Calusa and the Tequesta tribes occupied the Florida Keys, with the Calusas being the principal tribe as early as 800 AD. Soon, however, Spanish colonizers settled in the Keys, primarily to gather turtles for food and hardwood for building ships. This triggered mistrust between them and the Native Americans. The indigenous people continued to occupy the Keys until the 1700s. Along with the 18th century colonization came piracy, which was rampant in these parts during this time period due to dejected naval sailors being lured to the lucrative life of piracy as opposed to naval contracts not being fulfilled. Some of the more infamous pirates who frequented the Keys were those such as Calico Jack Rackham, Anne Bonny, and Blackbeard. See episode 38 for more on them and their history. But one pirate who deserves a special mention is Black Caesar. Legend has it that he ruled the Florida Reef from a lair at Elliot Key, one of the many islands found north of Key Largo. He conducted raids on villages and attacked unsuspecting ships, amassing a fortune and even having a harem of a hundred women. Theories abound about his origin, with some suggesting he was a captured African slave. But his life of piracy came to an end after Blackbeard's death, and he was captured, hanged, and buried in Williamsburg, Virginia. His hidden treasure, however, is said to still be buried somewhere in the Florida Keys, waiting for a lucky adventurer to find it. One of Key West's most infamously haunted locations is the Key West Lighthouse. The original structure was built in 1825 and stood 65 feet tall. The first keeper, Michael Maberty, died in 1832, and his wife Barbara took over and ran it for 32 years, something that was highly unusual for the time. The lighthouse was destroyed in the Great Havana Hurricane in 1846, and a new structure was built two years later, almost 20 feet higher. Barbara, who was uninjured in the hurricane, continued to run the new lighthouse until the early 1860s when she was fired at the age of 82 for making statements against the Union, who controlled Key West throughout the entire Civil War. The lighthouse went on operating for another 30 years, surviving countless hurricanes, and in 1894 it was raised another 20 feet to a height of 100 feet above sea level. The Coast Guard decommissioned the Key West Light in 1969 and was turned over to the Historical Society. Barbara Maberty passed away three years after she was fired from her post at the lighthouse, but having spent most of her life there, it's believed her spirit still lingers. Some visitors to the lighthouse claim to have felt a presence nearby, followed by eerie cold spots, and in some cases, even report being touched by unseen hands. Other visitors swear they felt somebody stroke their hair, and even seen the apparition of an elderly woman inside the lighthouse. 428 Green Street, 1998. Aaron had to see it to believe it. His trip to Key West wouldn't be complete until he went to see the infamous restaurant that had an old tree growing from the middle of the bar room. So that's exactly what Aaron and his friends did. It was easy to figure out what bar it was. Everyone in town seemed to be familiar with it. They located it and stepped in the front door. Sure enough, there it stood, as if it were standing at the bar, waiting for a drink. A large tree trunk growing from the floor, jutting up through the roof. Impressive, Aaron thought. After several drinks and conversation with the locals in the bar, the group of friends learned that the tree had been used for public executions in the 18th and 19th centuries. They also learned that the tree and the building were allegedly haunted by the spirits of those who were hanged there. Aaron found this fascinating, but his friends were more amused by the seemingly tall tale. Aaron's friends began teasing him for believing it and dared him to climb the tree. This is something that Aaron wouldn't ever consider, but he was four margaritas deep and was feeling brave. He set his drink down and pushed past his jeering friends and placed both hands on the tree trunk. Immediately, he felt his hands burning, and naturally he recoiled, only he couldn't pull his hands from the tree. He felt the skin on his palms sizzling, and he began to scream. 
His friends thought he was kidding, so they just laughed and teased until they smelled the burning flesh. They immediately grabbed Aaron by the shoulders and tore him from the tree. There were two black handprints on the tree trunk that quickly faded away. Aaron sat on the floor, staring at his blistered hands in disbelief. His friends rushed him to the hospital, where even the doctors were perplexed by the third-degree burns on Alex's hands. He was bandaged up and sent on his way. He never stepped foot in that bar again. Key West is home to Southern Florida's most notorious saloon, Captain Tony's. Once called Sloppy Joe's, the bar was the favorite hangout of the likes of Ernest Hemingway, Truman Capote, JFK, and Jimmy Buffett. It was built in the 1930s and purchased by Captain Tony Terracino in 1958, hence the new name. It was a popular spot, but the building always seemed to have a dark history from the very beginning. There are very old trees on the property that were used for public hangings, one of which is actually in the building. There were 75 to 85 people hanged there for murder, piracy, and other crimes. The building was also used as a morgue and then a bordello, a telegraph office, a speakeasy, and a cigar factory. Given its macabre history, it's no surprise that the infamous saloon is known to be haunted. One of the entities that haunt the saloon is a spirit known as the Blue Lady. The legend of the Blue Lady dates back to the Hanging Tree. Said to be one of the people hanged there for her crimes, the story goes that she stabbed her husband and two children to death. The people of Key West wasted no time in condemning her to swing from the hanging tree. Mob Rule had her hanged in the same bloody blue dress she was wearing when she killed her family. Ever since, her ghost has been seen throughout the building in her bloody blue dress, scaring patrons and staff. One night after closing, Tony, the bar owner, was with a waitress counting draws when the balmy breeze unexpectedly turned icy. At first, they looked around but didn't see anything. Then, the waitress looked up and screamed. There, they saw floating above them the ghost of a woman in blue, her neck elongated and cheeks sunken, hair billowing in wispy strands like spider's silk, thin and weightless in the cold breeze. Then, just as quickly as she appeared, she was gone, vanished into the night. Another spirit that haunts the saloon is that of a beautiful young woman, Locals believe she is the spirit of a woman who, years ago, in search of her husband, showed up to the saloon with her baby. At the time, the saloon functioned as a speakeasy, and sure enough, that's where she found him. But he wasn't alone. She found him drunk and kissing another woman. In a blind fury, the woman rushed into the bathroom and killed her baby, leaving it in the sink before running out of the building. It's unclear what happens to the woman after that, but many believe she was hanged for her crime. Now, and ever since, her spirit, like that of the Blue Lady, has been seen roaming about the bar, crying and wailing for the loss of her baby. The saloon is haunted by many ghosts, but the most famous haunting is Elvira, the dead woman who sleeps beneath the floor. In the 1980s, the building was undergoing some major renovations, and part of the job required the floorboards to be pulled up. What the crew found underneath shocked them. Just beneath the floor were the remains of around 20 human beings and a gravestone. The stone marked the burial site of a young woman named Elvira Drew. Elvira Drew lived in the early 1800s and was married at the very young age of 14 to a much older man in his 60s. He was an abusive alcoholic, and in December of 1822, when Elvira was 19 years old, she decided she had had enough. Her gravestone marks the day of her death that same year. She was hanged at the hanging tree. Her crime? Murdering her abusive husband. There was another gravestone found in the floor of a woman named Reba Sawyer. She lived from 1900 to 1950, and when she died, apparently her husband found some very scandalous letters between her and her lover and some forbidden rendezvous that they had together. They would always sneak out and meet at Captain Tony's for their secret dates. The husband was so mad that he took his wife's coffin and dug a hole for it under the tree at the bar. He said, this is where she wanted to be, so this is where she will stay. Now these women haunt the very place of their execution. Their disembodied moans and wails can be heard reverberating throughout the building. 
and their apparitions have been seen roaming around at night. It's unclear whether their spirits are vengeful or lost, wandering through the dark in a world unknown, where the ocean meets the land by the wave-polished rocks. Beneath the floor sleeps the mystery along with their bones. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome, open, welcome into episode number one hundred and nineteen. I am Jesse Wilkins. I'm joined by Rob Coakley. Hello, Rob. I'm very torn right now because, on one hand, it seems like it's legal to bury somebody under a bar, and that's, of course, what I would do to Dave. Yeah. But on the other hand, that would be the happiest place for him to be buried. So, <laughs> true. I don't know what to do here. Very Give true. the man what he wants, right? We're also joined by Dave. Hello, Dave. I'll bury me under that bar right now. <laughs> <laughs> That, what a cool place. What a cool place. There's a there's a diner like within walking distance of my house that has a tree inside, but it doesn't go through the roof. How do you make the tree go through the roof without having Structurally, a yeah, I was having, wondering that the entire time I was researching this episode because I've done roofs. I used to be a roofer and I have no idea. It's so hard to just even flash in like a like a vent, never mind an actual tree with branches. It's so confusing. I mean, not only that, like, so obviously the tree was there first, they built around it, right? But the, the, how do you get it not to leak? I don't know. Maybe it does leak. Who knows? Maybe, yeah, maybe they just embrace it. I don't know. Open concept. <laughs> Open concept. Who knows? Anyways, uh, so this is episode 119. Thanks to everyone who is joining live. Also, people who are now able to watch on Spotify. We had mentioned it last week. We're going to try to do video on Spotify. It seems like it's a, it's a uh, success. Yes. So for now, I mean, you can actually watch these videos on Spotify, which is pretty damn cool. And, and you're going to want to watch this one on Spotify because there are some terrifying images throughout the opening story. Mm. There are. Yep. Uh, I want to give a quick shout out to Matthew T for gifting 10 Hometown Ghost Stories memberships on YouTube. Thank you so much. And for those of you on Apple Podcasts, I mean, you could consider switching over to Spotify to watch these videos. You could. You can, wait, wait, wait. They can just listen on both. Could listen on both. And if Apple ever wants to sponsor the show, then we'll tell you to switch back to Apple. <laughs> so that's kind of how these things work, right? Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, uh, today we actually have a special guest on the show. So joining us is Matt Leslie, uh, director and very talented guy. He's got a long resume. It's all in the show notes if you want to check that out. So let's switch views here and bring in our special guest, ladies and gentlemen, Matt Leslie. What's up, guys? What's hey. going on? How Thank you so you? much for joining. Fellow, fellow, yeah, man, fellow mass holes. I love it. Oh, nice. Yeah, I was looking at that. You're born in Salem. That's one of our favorite places. We try to make a uh, a yearly trip, at least annual annual trip. Sometimes we do it a few times, but Salem's one of our favorite places to go. Love it. Absolutely love it. Especially yeah. around uh, yeah. time. Yeah, born in Salem and I was raised in Ipswich. Yeah, you didn't fool me, uh, Matt. I watched Summer of 84 and um, yeah. I saw that <laughs> the town go. name was Ipswich, Oregon. I <laughs> knew that reference. Yeah. Well, it's funny because we, it was originally supposed to be Ipswich, Massachusetts, obviously, and we were going to try to shoot it in Massachusetts, but we just couldn't uh, get it going there. So we ended up shooting it in Vancouver and uh, uh, did a quick pivot. <laughs> you didn't want to do the Eli Roth thing? He filmed Thanksgiving in Vancouver, and the whole time we were sitting in the theater watching it, we were like, that's not Plymouth. We know Plymouth. <laughs> Dave lives in Plymouth. So. Yeah, I know. We we talked about it, but the Pacific Northwest is so specific, and we had yeah. so many exterior shots of like the forest, and the forest in Massachusetts looks so different. So we were like, yeah, we can't really pull this off. But uh, yeah. I didn't know that about Thanksgiving. That's hilarious. Yeah, if you ever watch it, you'll you'll be like, ah, oh, it kind of looks like Plymouth, but it ain't. <laughs> it did. Yeah, I did. I saw it. I yeah. saw it. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 re I don't really remember the, the locations, the look of them. I remember that the downtown area that's supposed to be like the downtown Plymouth or whatever, it, it looked like kind of any old school town USA. Right. Well, the, um, the downtown shots yeah. actually did look a little bit like Plymouth. The only problem was like in the distance, you can kind of see like a mountain range and we're like, we don't have those. Definitely don't have those. Other than that, it, it did no, actually have kind of the same downtown look. But again, you get that kind of downtown look in any older town, especially in Massachusetts. Yeah, for yes. sure. 
Cool. Well, right, thank you so much for joining. Then. We're talking Key West, Florida today. A few haunted locations here. Dave covered uh, covered those and some really creepy ones. I'm excited to talk about the bar, but let's talk about some of these haunted locations in and around Key West. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll start off with the lighthouse. But first of all, this episode is dedicated to our only Hometown Ghost Stories employee, Kate Wilkins. It's her birthday today. So if you see her in chat, wish her a happy birthday. I know mm-hmm. a lot of you already did, but... Dedicated to you. Thank you. That's my wife. We're yes. cutting Happy, your pay. Happy right? birthday, Kate. <laughs> We're cutting your pay from zero dollars to you actually have to pay us to work for us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. So uh we started off talking about the Key West lighthouse, which is a pretty cool lighthouse built in the eighteen hundreds. And it didn't last a terribly long time. It was destroyed by the Great Havana hurricane, which was a massive disaster, mostly for Cuba, but it also wiped out pretty much all of Key West. I included some of the uh, the images in that intro video of, of some of the damage there, and it was absolutely catastrophic. It takes a lot to take out an entire lighthouse, and this one looks like it was pretty built pretty sturdy, so that says a lot. But they rebuilt it, and uh, it still stands now. I think they decommissioned it in the 60s. Uh, now it's a museum, but it functioned as a lighthouse for a really long time, and it was run by uh, a woman for a really long time. And in the 1800s, that was extremely uncommon. First of all, uncommon for a woman even to have a job in that time, especially um, a job like running a lighthouse, which was typically done by a man. So she had to, she felt like she had to prove herself and she did a great job for all of the duration that she ran it. And then uh, it was uh, it was kind of sad. They they kicked her out at the end. She was an 82 year old lady, and they fired her for making <laughs> for making comments. I mean, to be fair, she was making anti union comments in favor of the Confederacy. So <laughs> take that you know for what it's worth. But, right, right, right. Poor lady, I guess. But uh, she died a few years after, and she now haunts that lighthouse so she dedicated most of her life to the role of the keeper so it's no surprise that even in death her spirit still lingered to look after the tower yeah well that's that's kind of like what we talk about with the residual hauntings right so especially when you live and work in the same place for what did she what did you say 175 years she was there yeah or something right around close there, to yeah. That. <laughs> so like when you're doing the same thing over and over and over and over again the most likely haunting is you doing some boring shit honestly mm-hmm. like that's like isn't that the biggest fear it's like you want to come back you want to haunt people you want to scare the shit out of them but it's you like washing the light just constantly just like oh, i gotta make sure that this light works all the time yeah uh, like what are you what are you doing do- the shit you hated in life forever yeah it's a nightmare it sucks, yeah. especially in this particular lighthouse now it's a nice looking lighthouse but if you watch the intro video of that video of the person walking up the stairs there's nothing to do in that lighthouse except walk up and down the stairs it's the only thing so her haunt that's probably what she's doing the whole time just going up and down that spiral staircase mm. She's got a sleeping bag wow. set up on a staircase. Doesn't even have a bedroom. It's, it's rough. It's a rough time. In <laughs> I, was, I got exhausted watching the video of just the clapping. I'm like, I, I, that's how out of shape I am. I lost my breath. I was like, this is too. This is difficult to watch. So put it. Should have put a separate separate viewer discretion advice for, for people who are out of shape like me. <laughs> also, if you get dizzy really easily, that'll do it as well. Advised. So there was a, a story from a tourist. A woman claims that while she climbed the painful 88 steps to reach the top of the lighthouse, she felt somebody following behind her. She was not alone. Her family was also touring the light tower, so she assumed it was one of her family members catching up to her. The woman looked back to see who was making the trek with her, but there was no one there. She brushed it off, more focused on the burn she was working up from the climb. Several minutes later, she reached the top, at which point she stopped to catch her breath. As she stood there, she felt a sudden cold breeze, a feeling she welcomed among the scorching Florida heat. The top of the lighthouse offers stunning panoramic views, which you can't get anywhere else. So as the woman took her time staring out the window and appreciating the view, she felt somebody give her a hug. At that moment, she felt comfort, not a shred of fear. After learning about Maberty, the woman had no doubt that it was her who embraced her so kindly. So that's kind of creepy. Mm. Creepy, but could have, been, could have been creepier. I could mean, it been. was like a nice comforting hug. It sounded like it was something that she wasn't scared of. And honestly, after climbing all those steps, you get a cool breeze that's going to cool you down. And then a hug like, oh, we did it together. We climbed these 88 goddamn steps. Yeah. So 
I would have thought it would have gone the other way though. Cause like the, the apartment, my apartment in Los Angeles, there was a, a before I moved in, there was a woman apparently who lived there fell down, or a couple times before me, um, a couple tenants before me fell down the stairs and died. Mm-hmm. And so whenever, I'm, whenever I'm at the top of those stairs, I just picture like, like something shoving me down them. So that's oh. where I thought that was going to go. Yeah, it, it could have. And sometimes those do, stories do go exactly that direction, but this one kind of nice. I don't know if I just, if I just climbed 88 stairs and I was sweating, the last thing I want is a hug from anyone. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds pretty awful. A nice warm hug from a ghost. But I guess if it's coming from a ghost, I guess that's fine. Um, her, her name was Barbara Marberty. Maberty. Maberty. Barbara Maberty. So, we have to have a discussion about like, if you're going to marry somebody, right, you cannot take a name that just makes your full name sound like you're just mumbling the whole time. What is that name? Did you marry Barbara Marity? You can't do it. You got to You got to either keep your name or you got to come to some sort of, you know, something has to happen there. You can't do it. It's just not allowed. And you can't smoke Marlboro cigarettes either because then it's, I got to get Barbara Marlboro's and Marlboro's. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. You sound like you're having a stroke. <laughs> yeah. So they, uh, Barbara's granddaughter, Mary Armanda Fletcher, married a man from New York by the name of John Carroll. Nothing wrong with that name. That sounds good. Just John Carroll. Mm-hmm. Thanks. John began his career as assistant keeper of the lighthouse before becoming keeper in 1866. Mary followed, the, Mary followed in her grandmother's footsteps, serving as assistant keeper until 1889. Her husband's death forced her to assume the primary role. John contracted typhoid fever, typhoid fever and died merely days later. Mary took over, but she too died three months later from the same disease. The couple passed in the keeper's quarters and they are believed to haunt that area. And when people go into there, they feel that they are surrounded by some sort of presence. And it's usually uh, an overwhelming presence that's felt. They were smart. They stayed away from the stairs for the haunting. They they went to the bedroom. They were like, (laughs) walking up and down those things. Exactly. You have typhoid fever. You can't expect them to climb all those steps with that fever, you know? Yeah, that's a fair fair point. Absolutely. So that's the uh, the lighthouse. Pretty uh, interesting history there. And some... Not so scary ghosts. Sounds like pretty much friendly ghosts all around, which is nice from time to time. Do you say this lighthouse got destroyed, or do they rebuild it, or are we talking they re- about? They rebuilt it. It was destroyed in the. It was destroyed almost immediately. They built. It was built in the early 1800s. It was destroyed in the. The uh, yeah 1840s. Okay. And then, uh, yeah. So just, it is. It is still there today. Do they turn mm-hmm. into a museum or anything? Is that something that you can go visit? Yep, it's a museum you can visit nice. now. Nice. Put it on the Ooh. list. It's on the list. How often do you guys go and visit these places? A few times a year. We just did Austin back in February, checked out the Driscoll Hotel and a few other locations there. We're going down to, uh, we're actually going up to New York this weekend and then New Orleans later this year. Nice. So is, the, is the Driscoll the one that was like a sanitarium at one point? And then they, or am I no. thinking of a different place? No, it was always a hotel. Um, okay. I don't yeah. Know. Sorry. Yeah. There, there's many sanitary former sanitariums. I don't know. Is there a sanitarium out there that got turned into a hotel? That'd be crazy. Was that Emily Morgan? That was a hospital. Was a hospital. So that's close yeah. by. That's in San Antonio. Obviously, you know that, Dave. But the um, yeah, that was a hospital for a number of years. It was built on the uh, people in chat know this, but it was built on the uh, original location of the Long Barracks of the Alamo. Super haunted. And that was a super play- cool place to visit. Yeah. Absolutely. So you have high expectations of our chat. What? Well, I'm saying that a lot of them have listened to a lot of episodes. We've talked about the <laughs> Emily Morgan several times. So that we have. So let's get on to the main focus of this of this episode, which was Captain Tony's, which is a pretty, yeah. pretty cool saloon. A lot of crazy stuff went on there. Um, credit to the book that I got this story from, or a lot of the stories from is Coast to Coast Ghosts by Leslie Rule. Really cool book if you like to real haunting small across the country. I use this book to reference this episode. I also use this book to reference the Modesto episode a couple of years ago and real, you know, really cool ghost stories. So she, I hate that you said a couple of years ago. Now I feel like we've been doing the show for, you know, centuries. Yeah, we have been doing it for centuries. So, <laughs> so here we are, but here we are back in Key West. So Key West, we covered in, I think it was episode 60, 
what, what episode was the corpse brad rob oh, yeah. 69 of course oh it's the only one i know off the top of my head <laughs> I, I was just like there's no way he's gonna know this off the top of his head but of course because you're a 13 year old boy at heart <laughs> because we did episode 69 <laughs> on valentine's day yep we did that's right wow. okay, that's why I remember. <laughs> a little bit on the nose <laughs> yeah. a little bit on the nose but... that's right yeah so uh we and then we covered the key west again when we did robert Vidal. Also, I believe. Mm. So, we've uh, we've done Key West. Who knew Key West was so haunted? I know, not a place that would ever pop into my mind. Yeah, and I only covered two locations. There's several other ones. We uh, there's the Ernest Hemingway House is also a haunted location. I saved that one because we could cover it for Celebrity Ghosts sometime. But, but yeah, so Captain Tony's pretty crazy place. The bar was built around an old hanging tree. So this was the tree that they used to use to execute people back in the 17 and 18. What a bizarre choice. Like, how does that, how, when you go back to the, like the beginning of this bar, who was like, yeah, let's build this, let's build this, build this like place of communion and, and, and joy around a place where everyone was hanged. Yeah, was I know. It's, strange. It seems like a weird thing to do. I know the building was there before it was a bar. It was a uh, morgue at some point. It was a uh, speakeasy. <laughs> Even worse. Yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't help with the haunted situation. I'm just baffled that like, yeah. they're picking out their plot of land. They're like, oh, we'll buy this. All right, we're going to build a morgue or whatever it was first. And they're like, well, we got that giant tree. Like, yeah, I'm just going to keep it. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> tree. it all it. makes sense. If you build the morgue around the tree, you don't actually have to store them anywhere. You just leave them hanging on the tree, right? You just do all your work right there. Yeah, they're already in the building. What else do you have to do? I know. Well, they. Uh, I, I'm guessing it had something to do with it being such a historical landmark that they probably didn't. They weren't either weren't allowed to t- take the tree down, or yeah, but not a good one. I mean, yeah. it's you, comes it's for executions. Yeah, <laughs> gotta keep that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so either way, the tree's there. It has a super dark history, and they 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 executed several people there. I think the number was like 85 or so. So there could be as many spirits as 85 haunting this place, but we got at least four that we know of based on the gravestones and local legend. So the first one was Elvira and she was the 14 year old who was married off to some old abusive piece of shit in his fifties or sixties, which already is a horrible situation. Mm. And she put up with him for five years before finally saying enough is enough. And she decides to murder him, which fine. Fair enough. Right. Yeah. I'm (laughs) on her side on this one. Yeah. Same. But uh, unfortunately nobody else was. So they, they hanged her at the tree and she is the, the most famous haunt of that location, but she's not alone. That's the blue woman. No, no. The blue lady is someone else. We don't have a name for her. She was the one, the blue lady was the one who stabbed her husband and two children. And she was basically executed the same day because people were so appalled by uh, by that, understandably so. And so according to townspeople at the time, her official diagnosis was, this is quote, she had a case of the ugly wugglies. That was uh, the- Of course. <laughs> Bar- Barbara Mar- 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 probably diagnosed there. <laughs> Yes. When my, when my kids ask what is wrong with Rob in his face, I tell them, "Well, he's got a case of the ugly wugglies." They understand. Yeah, and uh, so that so you can't just go around with the ugly wugglies. If you do that, they will hang you. And that they she was the one that was described. Wait, wait, wait. Could, I'm sorry. Did you explain what this case is? Is it just an ugly person? So they, what is no, the case of the ugly? Wugglies? I don't think I don't think they mean that she was ugly. It's they said that she had a case of the ugly wugglies to describe her going completely insane and murdering her whole family. Is so that in I, the constitution? <laughs> not, it it's should the be. Bill of rights. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay. So the, so the ugly wugglies are what caused her to do this heinous crime. I, th- I thought this was like also a condition that they thought she had. I'm like, please explain what ugly wugglies are. Right. I think no. that's actually what we're looking for. Ugly wugglies. Yeah, see, if uh, see if we can get a, uh, See if we can get some answers on what exactly the ugly wugglies were. It sounds like a it sounds like a band name of a band that I wouldn't want to listen to. <laughs> oh, you definitely don't want to hear that band. Yeah, like like you're at a bar, you're having a good time, you're talking to friends, yeah. and they're like, all right, and then all of a sudden you hear on the microphone, like, all right, we're gonna have some live music. It's the ugly wugglies. And we're like, we're finding a new bar. Oh my god. It's just, death, it's just death metal teletubby songs. 
but it, but the because, acoustic version because you're at a bar oh yeah god. oh my god i hate it out of there <laughs> but she was the, yeah, the ghost. popping up shockingly oh, i'm shocked <laughs> color, me, <laughs> color me shocked <laughs> Good thing. Maybe there's a, is there so many, there's just so few cases of the ugly wugglies these days, I, I feel. But she was the ghost that was described as the one in the blue dress covered in blood and with the elongated neck and sunken cheeks. Creepy stuff. Doesn't sound like a pleasant sight to see. This was the ghost that came to Tony and uh, appeared when they were closing up one night. And they said they'd see her from time yeah, to that, time. That image of like, people under the floorboards and you're supposed to pull those floorboards up. Yeah. Terrifying. That's like <laughs> such a great scene for a horror movie. Yeah. Oh, good. Might good. snag that. <laughs> it's all yours. <laughs> we'll talk after. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like just adding the word, what was it? Ugly wugglies or whatever. Like, like it, it really diminishes how horrifying of a story this actually is. Goes yeah. in the bathroom, yeah. kills the baby. Like this is an awful, this is an awful story from start to finish. This is, this is horrifying. Those are two different stories now. That was a lot of a lot of horrible things went on in this bar, apparently. So the the ghost of the beautiful young woman, which is not what I named her, that's just what they call her. That's the one who murdered her baby in the bathroom. She, apparently it's not what you typed into AI either, because you generated these horrifying images of this old woman with a long neck and different, sunken in eyes. Different ghost. You're, oh, you're that just, was you're, you're conflating so many ghosts. We have we have yeah. different definitions of beauty. I was saying that's the beautiful one. <laughs> <laughs> in the eye of the beholder, some would say. It's so bizarre that there's so many female husband murdering ghosts in this bar. Like they're that they're all blending together. I can't separate them anymore. They all just are like it's, I know it's kind of it's kind of wild that there's it is because there's there's they're all different they're all different cases, but they're all somewhat similar yeah. in one way or another. But uh, and he yeah, was he, seems to have level one thinking of naming their ghost. It's like, oh, that's the big beautiful ghost over there. That's the ghost yeah. in blue. <laughs> blue <laughs> ghost, yeah, pretty ghost. <laughs> Ugly. By the way, did you say that JFK hung out at that bar? Yeah, they had a whole bunch of famous people. They had JFK, they had Truman Capote. It was Ernest Hemingway, which makes sense because he lived. Down that's the crazy. Yeah, this was a popular spot. Yeah. Well, Tony Tarasino, wow. who was the owner, was a popular guy. He ran for mayor. He won. And he would just, while he was mayor, he would just be known for hanging out at the bar, drinking and hitting on women. And everyone loved him, which it's is real, just, it's real mayor, mayor behavior there. <laughs> yeah. he, pulled it, he pulled it off. Oh. I wonder, like, how common knowledge was all this shit for people who are just like the average guy that pulls up a chair at the bar and grabs a beer. Like, does, is are they aware of all this shit that's going that's happened there, or is it just sort of like been unearthed in the years since? Because, like, I wouldn't want to hang out at like a like go hang out at a bar and listen to music, <laughs> like a place where there's a murder tree, like a hanging tree with eighty people at the foot of it. Like, that's insane. Yeah, it does sound insane. Um, I would like that. Yeah, but, yeah. I'm, I'm in. But I'm we, have, we have different goals in mind. <laughs> for <laughs> different reasons. <laughs> for different reasons. Yeah, for different reasons. Right. Uh, I'm going to say they 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 got to have an idea because the tree is there. There's literally a gravestone at the foot of the tree and then another gravestone off to the side. So, yeah, if no. I didn't know the story, I would go in and be like, that's a, that's a cool thing and that's cool decoration. I would never assume that it's a real gravestone. It's, and it's just such a crazy thing to think about. It is. And that gravestone that sits at the foot of that tree is Reba Sawyer. So that was the lady who, she died in 1950. And her husband, when he was going through her things, found, like before she was even buried, found love letters between her and her, her, her secret lover and found out that they used to just rendezvous at, at Captain Tony's all the time when they would sneak off for their secret dates and he lost his mind and he, the story goes. And I, if, so at face value, I thought this was complete nonsense because it makes no sense. It's an insane story. Yeah. He, that he they let him bury her there. <laughs> he drags the coffin there and just like, I'm burying her here, Tony. And it's like, you, Jesse, you, you have a restaurant. Someone <laughs> drags the coffin of their dead wife and starts yeah. digging a hole in the middle of your restaurant. You're not going to be like, oh, shit, I guess that's where she goes now. <laughs> that's yeah, Tony got there in the morning. He was like, fair enough. Fair enough. You know what's crazy is like we're, we're in Dorchester, which is a pretty rough part of Boston. And if... 
if the wife came home and told me that that happened at work today, that like someone presented that opportunity, I'd be like, yeah, just another day. You know, like <laughs> people don't believe the stories that happened when you work in the city. The city is a weird place, man. It's a weird but, place. But you, you immediately want to just brush this story off as something that's like, of course that didn't happen. Of mm. course somebody didn't yeah. drag a coffin into the bar and dig a hole in somebody else's restaurant and bury their wife there. Of course that didn't happen. But the fucking gravestone's there. <laughs> That is the most outrageous True. request that we've heard on this show. Like it really is. It really is. You hear the story like, oh yeah, that's just a weird legend, but just like, just put yourself in that position. Put yourself in that position. <laughs> I'm burying her here. Like what? No, you're fucking not. <laughs> go away and bring her where she's supposed to go. I guess and, it was a morgue before. It's not the crazy. And why does this keep happening and, in Key West? Right? Florida, like is man. the corpse All bride was the another one that they oh, he just right. took her right out of the, out of her, uh mausoleum out of her coffin took her to her house i mean he stuffed her and kept her around for seven years so that's a little different oh we went God. a little further maybe a little too far some would say some allegedly would say. some would say how does squash but, brings up the weirdest point which i don't know if it's true or which might be crazy enough where it might be might actually be accurate he says the ugly wugglies were cured in 1832 <laughs> there was a small outbreak in 1892 in fall river massachusetts how specific that is makes me nothing think good happens true. in Fall River. <laughs> <laughs> nothing confirm. good happens yeah. in Fall River. Nothing good has happened in Fall River Fall since River. 1892 when they <laughs> had the ugly wugglies outbreak. <laughs> mm. The fact that this that this one we're talking about was buried in 1950 was more jarring because it just feels so yeah. close. Like we started this show in 1950. <laughs> right so like that's how it sounds too recent to do something that outrageous and them agree to it right yeah if this was like this in dude the... tony already owned the bar exactly like, like if this was the early like i'm running for mayor in five years <laughs> <laughs> all right before i run for mayor we gotta bury this body no, this... yeah <laughs> like if this it was, was like early... his campaign yeah he's, he's like he's like um not only will I be the best mayor ever, but you can bury your wife at my bar when she dies. <laughs> and that's why make sure she's dead first. Yeah. <laughs> Or don't. Yeah. I'll store the body. Somehow hey, hey, the hey, hey, the Kennedy's like the bar for a reason, right? Somewhere to store the bodies. <laughs> oh my God. Ted Kennedy went there often <laughs> right after Chapman <laughs> Oh my God. Had to God. take a quick detour with the car, get a rental, and then head down to Florida. Yeah. Right? Yep. Yikes. Oh my God. So, uh, Moving on. Crazy. Somehow that's crazy. like the craziest of the stories, though, is the guy who just buried his wife there. It's just, I don't know bonkers anyway so the current bar owner is named joe farber and he's got a ghost story of his own uh, i believe tony died in early 2000s so joe owns it now so he and, never considered what's that in honor of it this show being dedicated to kate this week um can you say joe farber's name the way that kate would say joe farber's name joe faba joe faba <laughs> joey faba <laughs> <laughs> So he never considered himself to be open to ghost stories or experiences of the sort. It's funny how many ghost stories start off. People have to qualify that they, I didn't believe in ghosts until, yep. but he says that after a few experiences in the bar, he may now be a believer in the paranormal. One night he was closing up and it was around 4 AM. He heard somebody calling his name. He got up from what he was doing and saw nobody there. He walked back, but noticed some doors were open that had closed and locked hours before. He didn't blame any of this on ghost, uh, ghostly activity because it didn't happen to him again until a few years later. The same voice was calling to him, and this time it said, don't leave, Joe. He didn't notice anything unusual, so around 3 a.m., he decided to go home. Around 6 a.m., Joe got a call from the police and said they, and they said they found a body in front of the bar. A young girl called her mom from the bar and had overdosed on pills to commit suicide. According to the police, she died there around 3.30 a.m. Joe thinks that the spirit was trying to tell him something. Perhaps he could have saved the woman's life. Hmm. So that's weird hmm. with the voice calling him, calling his name and trying to, he thinks that it was somebody trying to alert him of what was going on outside. Unfortunately, he didn't listen to the ghost. Well, that's, yeah. uh, the ghost had to be a fun pissed off. Yeah, that'd be yeah, a fun procedural have... show uh for for like nbc it's like ghosts who are dead helping living people solve crimes but the living people not paying attention until it's but then they're like yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> damn it yeah there's a specific kind of ghost and i don't remember what the classification is but that's 
what that kind of ghost does. It's there almost to warn people, almost like a, like a banshee will do, but a banshee is not a positive force, it's a negative, but there are positive versions of banshees that will, they'll basically give you a foreboding message. I think it's called a nosio. No, it's if, if you get the ugly wugglies during life, <laughs> you, you become a spookly wookly in death. <laughs> This is why people watch the show. We are experts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But yeah, that's pretty much uh, Tony's Tony's bar there, and it's pretty haunted and haunted with some very strange, very peculiar ghosts and very strange, very peculiar history. So, very cool. Absolutely. That is but, crazy. Place I want to go have a drink at. Absolutely. I would love to go down to Key West and check out. There's so many haunted locations down there. It's definitely, we could cover Key West again. There's enough down there that I didn't cover in this episode to thoroughly go through, go there in person. I mean, a, an excuse to take a trip to Key West. Absolutely. Like we it. also had pirate history, which is our favorite. We didn't even mention that. Everybody pirate hats go. Boom. Oh, there they are. We got them. Yeah. Nice. Perfect. Go. It's been a while. It's been a while since <laughs> we broke those out. We'd invite you to Key West, Matt, but you've already said you don't want to go. <laughs> well, I would go see where to me would it be more interesting if it's like an overnight visit to the bar versus just like pulling up a chair at four o'clock on a, like a Wednesday or something, you know, like I, I would only want to go if it was for the purposes of like trying to experience something. We we have sources. We might be able to make that happen at some point. That would be, that would be really cool. Sources. I mean, we send emails and hope that they <laughs> respond to us. Yeah. <laughs> when they do respond, we consider them sources. They've made yeah. the cut. Yeah. yeah. For some reason, Tony never, never wrote back. <laughs> Be Matt, you told us, uh, Matt, you told us you had some ghost stories of your own, some experiences that are pretty, pretty creepy. Hoping you well, <clears throat> one when I was like reflecting back on things that I could share that I, I guess are like, I've never experienced anything personally that's like in like super for sure paranormal where I'm like, that was a ghost, no question about it. But there are a few different things that have happened that are paranormal, I guess, that I figured I could just like tell you guys these quick stories and, and see what you think. Because my, my barometer, like I have a lot of different, like my wife has some friends who were like, Oh, I've seen ghosts. And they were like, I, you know, we're sensitives and whatever. And we can, and I'm, I'm like, well, you know, I don't know. That sounds a little bit fishy, but there are a couple of stories that I can't explain away that genuinely have me sort of um, believing that there's something else going. There's something else, you know what I mean? So to speak. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, nobody has the first one definitive experience ever. So if they, if that happened, then then there would be no question about ghosts. It would just be a fact. Well, something they don't have definitive right. experiences is can they provide definitive proof to prove yeah the skeptics wrong? And then the, when they do, they're like, no, it's too good. It must be fake. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's That's tough because it a lot of it's also just like it's subjective. Like you know, you experience something and you know you believe it and you're like convinced, but I wasn't there and I've never seen anything like that. So it's just like one of those things that until you experience it, it feels like it's just forever. Like maybe there's ghosts. I don't know. Maybe not. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. Um, so there's a so there's a couple I, I wanted to share. The first one is my wife, um, my wife Susie's mom passed away about ten years ago of an aneurysm very suddenly, and she was really shaken by the whole thing. And you know, for a long time, even to this day, really, she's like always hopeful that she'll see her mom in dreams, and you know that there could be some kind of a, you know, I don't know, a conversation, a moment, a something, a feeling, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and my wife Susie's friend Shandy is one of these people that I'm, that I'm talking about that claims to be like a sensitive or to sort of have this uh, ability to see ghosts or communicate or feel things or whatever. And uh, they were business partners for a, a couple of years and they were together. And this one morning, a couple of years after my wife's mom passed, Shandy and, and Susie woke up and um, Shandy said to Susie, she was like, hey, um, I had a dream and your mom was in it last night. And Susie was like, okay. And, you know, Susie's, I guess, I don't want to say a skeptic because she's, she's open to like whatever the possibilities are, but, um, you know, would be kind of tough to convince, I think of anything. And, and, uh, and Shandy said, does your, was your mom missing a tooth right, right here? And Susie was like, yeah, how did you know? Like legitimately nobody knew this, right? I didn't know this. I didn't know her mom. I'd, I've been with my wife for 20 something years, 24 years. Like I didn't know her mom. I knew her mom for a long time. I didn't know she was missing a tooth. She had like a, a fake tooth. And so Shandy goes, was your mom missing this tooth? And she goes, cause in the dream, she, she said, 
she took her tooth out and said, tell Susie I'm okay. And so that was all true. And like, you know, again, that's one of those things where I'm just like, I didn't know that Shandy definitely didn't know that nobody knew that this tooth that her mom was missing this tooth, which is, you know, just kind of one of those things where I was like, that's crazy. Like when, when Susie told me the story, I was like that, I can't explain that away. Yeah. I've heard that so many times with media, psychic mediums where they just, your first instinct is to not believe them, to believe that they are either con artists or, or what have you. But then they come up with this, with these, with these things that you, they couldn't possibly know. Yeah. And I, I know like when they do those big shows where there's like a whole room full of people they're yeah, they, they calling out these, these, uh, these, premonitions or predictions or whatever. And, you know, you're going to hit on some, something, but when it's something that specific to like, yeah. like you said, like about a single person's uh, one specific detail about a single person right there to their face, not in a room full of people. That's how do you explain yeah. it? That's like, the yeah. And we'd known Shandy for, for 15 years. It's not like, you know, like we, you know, we know that she's not just going to like say something like that, just make it up. Um, right. So it was just, that was one of those ones where I'm probably the the most uh, strange story that I we can't also, really explain. We also hear a lot like of loved ones coming back like immediately after they pass to try to to try to like the the people remaining to try to ease them while they're yeah with the loss. But I think this brings up a good point that I just have never thought of. Maybe you have to be sensitive enough to receive that message and yeah. Maybe you, your wife's not or whatever, and um, you, she waited until she was near someone that was sensitive yeah. enough to give that message. It could be it. It's it's a common haunting, and exactly like you said, Rob is is right after the death of someone is you'll get visited, and or you could get visited by the spirit of that person that just passed, and it's either you witness a, some something ghostly, or more commonly they visit you in a dream. But it'll be one dream. It'll be unbelievably realistic. They'll give you some message. And it seems like they're getting some sort of closure, or at least you're getting some sort of closure there. And it happens sometimes. Yeah. It doesn't happen right after the death, but it, it's a very common one. And it's it's so strange because um, so many people experience it. And you also, yeah. on, this, on the skeptic side of thing, it's like w- when you have a loved one who dies, this doesn't really match with your story. But in this case, I mean, like, like when you have someone who, who just passed away, they're on your mind nonstop. Yeah. That's all you're thinking about. So you might actually have just happen to have a dream about them because it's all <laughs> you're thinking about. But yeah, but I think it's all sure. too common that um, it could be something paranormal for sure. Yeah, story, this girl Shandy, story. the one, the one, I, the one that I was uh, mentioning, my wife's friend, is you know one of the stories that she told me that she claims is true is that when she was a kid, she would play with this next door neighbor boy, and one day um, she was telling her mom about this boy, and so her mom took her next door to the boy's house and said, "Hey, you know, is your son home? My my, my daughter would love to play with him because they were like new to the neighborhood," and, and the woman was like, "I don't have a son." turns out that the, there was a kid who was hit by a truck in the neighborhood like years before and had died. And it was that kid that, you know, really? was with the one that she was playing with. So, you know, she, that's the kind of stuff that she's, she says happened to her and, you know, who knows, maybe, you know, um, another story that, uh, is not something that I experienced, but it's one that my mom has shared with me on many times because it happened to her mom, her mom, uh, apparently like, you know, long before I was alive, had a dream where her own father came to her in her dream and said, come with me. And she, and she remembers saying, no, I can't go with you. You know, I have my, my kids, my kids are here. I can't, you know, I can't come with you. The next day she got, um, the next night she was in a near fatal car accident, a 16 year old kid. This is in Ipswich mass. A 16 year old kid apparently stole a car and crashed into her and she almost died. She was in the hospital for six weeks. Um, and uh, so that's one of those ones where it's like, you know, she she recounted to my mom that dream. And then another little really strange thing about that, it was at the bottom of a street that um, years, a year later, she ended up meeting a man and and married him and he lived on that street and totally coincidentally. So it was just like one of those, it's another one that like, you know, I don't know. Did you say a six-year-old stole a car? 16. 16. 16. Oh God, I was like, how <laughs> that would have been this? That would have been really right. <laughs> Had he not hit someone, it that was, was awesome. Yeah, he just was wanted to do hood time. rat stuff with his friends. <laughs> Dude, yeah, I know he was sixteen. What a callback! Stole a car. <laughs> yeah, that's not as cool. Not as cool as a six-year-old stealing a car. It's not. No, but yeah, those are like the only two things that have ever that are sort of like in my life that I can't just go bullshit. <laughs> you know, like like because a lot of times that's kind of what what some stories feel like. You know. 
Yeah. Yeah. But it's unfortunate, but it's true that you, and that's why a lot of people don't share their ghost stories because they don't want to be ostracized. Yeah. Or for sure. Seem like they're for you know, sure. a crazy person. So, yeah. The, the only thing that I've ever experienced that I, I can't explain that I, I was physically there for was when I was moving out of one of my, uh, an apartment and, um, I could hear my wife behind me and I was like, uh, Hey babe. And I turned around and she was definitely not there. And I, I yelled out for her and she was down in the kitchen. And, but it was like, there's no question. There was someone, I could hear someone right behind me moving around. And that happened again, like the same week, like, you know, a few days later where it was like, you know, you know, the sound where, you know, someone's like right behind you, yeah. mm -hmm. like the wooden floorboards creaking. But again, you know, that's not anything, you know, it's kind of like, yeah. whatever, maybe it was something, maybe it was nothing. And you can absolutely um, feel the presence of somebody when they're standing behind you. Like, yeah. This, this yeah, thing. for sure. And um, it, it was funny because that, that same week we went to, um, my wife and I went to dinner with our neighbors who lived right next in the apartment right next to us. And I told that story and he was like, and so the, the guy who lived in that apartment claims he was a, he's a sensitive and he'd seen, he'd seen dead people since he was a kid. And he was like, was it in the upstairs hallway? And I was like, yeah, it was. And he was like, there's been a man See, coming to me i've been seeing a man on that floor for the last few months Ooh. and i was like holy shit okay well maybe there's something to you're that just because... now telling me this <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah exactly. about letting me that thanks for the heads up <laughs> gonna let me know months ago maybe yeah, yeah. it's pretty terrifying yeah, those are those are but, um those are some that's really all i good... got yeah no those are good hauntings that's I mean, all i got i mean they are uh some of the ones that the good thing about some of those hauntings are stories you hear from lots of people. So that's what, you know, we always talk about, you want to see the same thing or hear about the same stuff going on over and over yeah. with other different people having the same experience. So it, it just like always brings me to believing more, you know, when we start yeah. getting those consistency. You guys, you guys have probably already been asked this and explained this like a million times, but of the three of you, who has the most convincing personal experience with the supernatural? Rob's uh, probably yeah, is pretty was... good. Although mine from, I don't remember it, but when I, uh, um, I'll, I'll summarize it. Cause I've told the story on this podcast a hundred times before, but when I was, when I was a, when I was about two years old, and we lived in Plymouth, in South Plymouth. My mother had noticed that I had had this imaginary friend named Bernie. And she was like, that's weird. Bernie such a strange name for a two-year-old to come up with, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then um, a few days later, the neighbor comes over and introduces herself. And they're, they're having tea. And the neighbor's talking about the former owner of the house. She says, oh, yeah, she was great, but she died. Uh, and her name was Bernadette. But everyone oh, called wow. her Bernie. And my mother was like, oh my God, my son has an imaginary friend named Bernie. So that was, uh, I mean, yeah. was pretty compelling. Yeah. So this, she told shit. me the story because I was, I was such a hardline skeptic and didn't believe anything. And she was like, oh, you know, you have a ghost story, right? And I was like, really? Oh. <laughs> it's fun. We kind of got like all the different points here. So Dave had the one when he was too young to remember. Uh, me and Robert Moore, not as skeptic as Dave is, although Dave has, has, has come around since we started doing the show. Rob, like, was in a haunted house for years, which is why we started the show. That was episode one of the show was recapping that whole entire haunting. And then we're all pretty sure that the house that I'm in right now is relatively haunted. doesn't seem to be anything oh. evil in this house, but there's something going on like pretty, pretty constantly here. And so we've been documenting that eventually when we run out of haunted places to cover, we'll finally cover my house. Once we, that'll be the final episode. <laughs> do you, uh, do you sage the place or like, what do you, do you do? Or do you like welcoming it? Cause you want to experience it and document it. I would, but my wife is religious, so she would not. So we've actually had a, uh, the priest come through and do a exorcism on the house at one point, once the hauntings got a little bit intense. So there was a point where we have been experiencing things where we're seeing shadows or we're hearing things get moved around. There was a magnet that like flew off the fridge way across the kitchen. And then I had the doorbell story. And I don't know if I told the doorbell story on this podcast. I might've, I know I told it on a different podcast, but this was the most horrifying thing that has ever happened. And I know that's, maybe Whoa. there's been more scary things. I don't, you know, car accidents and things that were more terrifying or more life threatening. But I had this one experience to summarize it. Doorbell rings. I'm like, oh, someone's at the door. I go check the front door. Nobody's there. I go check the side door. Nobody's there. I'm like, oh, that was weird. So I go back to doing what I was doing. Doorbell rings again. I'm like, what the hell? Someone, okay, so now it's a kid pranking me. So I go outside and I circle the house like a psychopath. 
no one's there. I'm like, what the hell is going on? So I go back inside. Again, a few minutes later, doorbell rings. I'm like, now I'm getting real pissed off. I'm like, they're good at this. So I go look around. Nobody's there. And then I'm like, this is so stupid. I call the wife. I'm like, has this ever happened? You know, like, like I don't know. Someone keeps ringing the doorbell. I think it's ding dong ditch. I don't know. And then once I like gave up, I'm like, whatever. It must just be faulty wiring or something. The doorbell starts going bing, 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 bing. <laughs> and like, dude, my heart was in my throat. I was like, I was, I've never been more scared in my life. I'm like, what? It was like, dude, it was like the ghost is like, yeah, I'm here, you piece of shit. Like, wow. <laughs> never experienced it it never happened again the doorbell still works fine it wasn't like shorting out or something like that it, i've yeah it was the most terrifying thing that's, that's crazy happened. yeah but then the, that's the, so crazy briefly after that i i heard um i was i was sleeping in or whatever and i hear commotion downstairs i'm like oh okay whatever like the, the mother-in-law had stopped by so i hear her in the house and i hear the kids coming up the stairs and then i feel what i thought was the wife like grab my shoulder and like drive her thumb into my shoulder blade i'm like all right all right i'm up like what the hell and no one's there. And I was like, oh, that was weird. And I said that out loud. And it was my wife coming up the stairs. And she's like, what was weird? I'm like, swear to God, you just grabbed my shoulder and drove your thumb into my shoulder blade. She's like, I didn't touch you. And she like, she went downstairs and called her the priest with her mother right there. They're Greek Orthodox. Whoa. So it was a big thing. Yeah. So that was kind of the haunting. Dude, there, the Greek Orthodox thing. So that's fascinating. I'm, I, there's a project that I'm a part of um, right now. And um, there's a there's a Greek Orthodox priest whose stories are the, the center of it. This guy named Father Maximus McIntyre. And he's a Mass He's actually a Massachusetts um, Greek Orthodox priest. And he he was with um, he came up doing like some like uh, paranormal investigating with Ed and Lorraine Warren before becoming a Greek, Greek Orthodox uh, priest. And um, when we were, we'd been having, you know, we had some conversations uh, over Zoom and he would always end the Zoom by being like, you know, guys, just like, you know, be careful because when you start talking about this stuff and you start opening up these, you know, these conversations, you're opening yourself up to these demons. And so if anything weird happens, don't be afraid to come to me and I'll, I'll, I'll come bless your house or whatever. And, you know, I'm, I'm an agnostic and like I admittedly, I don't, I, I think there's probably something happening in the universe, but I'm not, I don't, I'm like, I don't really have a specific religion or nothing's ever quite clicked for me, but I do think it's possible that there are demons or, or spirits or whatever. And so he, he would freak me out. Cause then suddenly my mind would be playing tricks on me. Like if sh weird shit happened, I'd be like, what was that? Could that be? <laughs> I think that demons, if demons do exist, they can exist absent religion. You know, because like if you look at any religion, there's sure. there's demons in every religion, first of all. Yeah. And if you read if you read any religious text, they uh they have classifications for everything. There's humans, there's animals, yep. there's spirits. So I mean, if the, if you can uh, entertain the idea that there is no religion, you could also ent entertain the idea that these things exist regardless of whether or not there's religion. So anytime yeah, somebody tries sure. to uh, dismiss demons because they don't believe in in God or whatever, I think that's yeah. uh, nonsense. We don't. Yeah, we don't try to drive religion or politics or anything on this show, but we kind of keep an open mind to everything where it's, yeah, this could, yeah, it's, anything's a possibility. Like we, the most famous saying on the show is we don't make the rules. So it's like if whether or not one thing's true or not, more. it doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that something couldn't be happening. So that's amazing. Yeah. And I'm not going to summarize any of my ghost stories for you. I What I will tell you is if you really want to hear them, go listen to episode one, but also don't judge us when you listen to episode one <laughs> because... I, I do. I got a little rough around ask, the edges. Yeah, the, I mean the the opening story audio is decent because I went and re-recorded that. So you know, don't tell. We anybody. didn't. Yeah, we didn't know that the show was gonna be even half as popular as it is now. Which I mean, we're still working on things, but I actually think I've. Mean, your think production value been, is legit. Oh, thank you. That's it's huge legit. coming from you. Yeah, <laughs> okay, for really? someone who actually knows what they're doing, we're just kind of figuring <laughs> out as we go. I'm just but, it. <laughs> yeah, I think I went back and it well, like guys. Class. Thank you. Yeah. And like the last couple of months, I went back and added a new disclaimer at the beginning of episode one, which is like, hey, bear with us. We promise these episodes get better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I do want to we should ask the chat and our discord if they would be interested in us um, sort of like going and redoing some of those early episodes. And if they'd like to hear us uh, do that in the future, not anytime soon, but maybe in the future, we can go and kind of remaster them and polish them up. Talk, talk, about, up talk about the stuff. Make sure we have make make believe we haven't already talked about it. <laughs> no, well, I think I think we can talk about it again. It's it's been eight hundred years since we've done them. But uh, real quick, Matt, let's talk yeah. about some of the projects you've 
done and what you have coming up because I, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I saw your interaction with Cody Leach, who I watched on oh, his yeah. reviews. So, like, I, we don't have to dive into that whole situation or anything like that. I mean, it's nothing bad, but um, no, it was really good. Yeah. Yeah. So, so because if it wasn't for that, so just so everyone knows, Matt wrote the the um, new Winnie the Pooh Blood and Honey Part Two, and the first one got you know flamed. And I I'll killed. Be- yeah, <laughs> I didn't see a single positive thing said about that first one. Yeah, it, but I'm seeing great, great things about this one. Like, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I it's funny. Like, I, I think how I got on Cody's radar is I, I put out a tweet where I basically was like, because people kept coming up because I wrote I wrote a film called Summer of '84, which is like a grounded um serial killer kind of um psychological thriller it premiered at sundance you know like it um and that's a very different movie than winnie the pooh blood and honey too but i always wanted to write a slasher and um so i put out people kept coming up to me being like you're you're writing winnie the winnie the pooh like what the fuck that first movie was terrible like why are you what are you doing and so i felt like i needed to kind of address it because i people kept asking about it so i just put out this tweet where i was like yeah look i'm i i i wrote winnie the pooh blood and honey too and here's how i got involved and it was basically just me explaining why i decided to do it and Mm -hmm. the quick version is basically the first one was not good but I had uh, my friend who was the composer for that first movie. His name's Andrew Scott Bell. He's a really, really talented composer. And I would say that the one bright spot from the first film to me was the score. Like it, it was just like, you know, it, it to me stood above everything, other every other element. And Andrew was like, look, these guys are making a sequel. Would you want to, would you be interested? And I was like, probably not, but I'll, I'd love to meet with the directors and just have a conversation because you don't know what's going to happen in this. In my business, it's like you don't know who's going to end up doing what in the future. So it's always good to meet people. And yep. so I met with um, the director of the first one. He wrote it as well. His name is Reese Frake Waterfield. And um, he's a British dude. And we just basically have a, had a chat about the first film. And I was like, I wanted to hear like the only way I would have ever been involved is if he was like, yeah, the first one wasn't good. I know it wasn't good, but I have aspirations for the second one. And that's basically what he did. He was like, look, I wrote the script in four days. No shit. He wrote it in four days, shot it in like six or seven or eight or something on a $20,000 budget. They had no idea it was going to blow up to what it was. Like they, they basically were like, they were kind of like a, the chop shop for like low budget, like, super cheesy horror films at the time they were just like cranking them out and they didn't know this one was going to be any different than any of the other ones like Mm -hmm. they made a christmas tree killing people movie like you know the christmas tree or something like the killing tree like they they were just like and then this blew (laughs) up right like so they were like oh shit and you know they admitted it wasn't good and that they and they also said they were going to have a much bigger budget for the sequel and when he started pitching some of his ideas i was like this could be kind of fun i've always wanted to write a slasher you know like i'm not a like I'm not the biggest slasher fan, but I, but I've always thought it'd be just fun to let loose and just like, you know, write something. So anyway, the stars kind of ended up aligning with what he was pitching and what he liked and what I, what I kind of thought would be fun. And so I just, I just wrote it, man. And I, it was a lot of fun and they made the movie. Um, it was a lot better than the first one. Um, you know, there was, it's still a very low budget movie. It was like a $415,000 movie, which I, you know, if for people who aren't who don't know like that's nothing like a marvel movie is 250 million dollars my movie summer of 84 which is considered really low budget was 1.5 around two million dollars um so four hundred fifteen thousand dollars is like nothing um and they still they 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 did a really good job um and i think it turned out fun you know so uh, it was like a mission accomplished uh it's it's opening in mexico on thursday i think it comes out on vod and sometime in june um that's still kind of to be determined but yeah i think you know if you if you can get past the premise of (laughs) and fucking tigger and owl and piglet killing people then you'll have fun i mean it's just a fun goofy movie i'm I'm, I'm, I'm all in yeah (laughs) yeah according to google it's i mean you know max on november 25th oh i don't think that's accurate yeah um but google said google (laughs) <laughs> yeah google <laughs> well then maybe it is right no I'm just, um, it's funny like I, like i told my little brother about this and he's like i'm just gonna get high as fuck and i'm gonna watch that it's gonna be awesome and that's kind of like that's kind of what it you know it's just like it's it's yeah. ridiculous but it's a lot of fun 
Well, we'll make sure to review it and we'll just talk about how terrible the writing was the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very sweet of you guys. We'd love to have you back on. Yeah. <laughs> then I'll invite you to that bar in Key West and I might have a knife. Uh, <laughs> or a rope. Yeah, or, yeah seriously. Uh, you could just grab one of Rob's draws that were hanging from the roof and just use that. To, <laughs> that'll work. I'll do the trick. You, do you have anything else coming up that you want to hit on real quick before we get into some reviews? Um, I'm not really like I, I wrote and directed a film uh, a couple years ago that's supposed to come out later this year. COVID awesome. kind of like, you know, um, kept it from coming out sooner, but it's called Don't Open the Door. It stars um, Shiloh Fernandez, who was in Evil Dead in 2011, and then um, Alexis Knapp from the Pitch Perfect series and Doug Jones from, you know, uh, uh, Guillermo del Toro fame. He was like, the fish yeah. man. He's basically the guy who's in every, you know, behind every costume in every movie that kind of matters. And, uh, but he doesn't have a costume on in, in our movie. And, um, it's a fun that. supernatural horror film. Awesome. Yeah, it'll be fun. Awesome. I, I look forward to that one as well. Um, and directing it. So I definitely will catch that. Um, it was, I, was like, yeah, I know was, the director. I know him. Yeah. It was my first, my first, my directing debut. So hopefully it's the first of many to come, but we'll see. Very, very cool. All right, we're going to jump. I Usually we would, would let the guests leave, Matt, but I think you're going to want to stick around because we let our okay. patrons pick their names. And I have a feeling this episode, some of our people are going to have some good patron names. So real quick, let's jump into some five-star cool. reviews first. This first one comes from YouTube and it's from Maggie. And yes, you can leave a five-star review on YouTube. Just throw it on a video. I will most likely see it. And she wrote this one on last week's Montana episodes. She wrote five stars. I absolutely love everything you guys do. This is by far my favorite podcast. I've been watching on YouTube for over a year now, and I can't get enough. I watched this episode live and just went back and rewatched it. It was that good. The videos are always great, but I really love the writing. It really puts you right there and makes you feel like you're a part of it. And then she quoted a part of the episode, which was, so I'll resign myself to isolation and the indifferent world outside these bars will move on without me as I waste away in this rotten tomb of iron and stone. End quote. I'd, I'd love to take credit for that since it's my episode, but I always have Dave write my opening ghost stories. <laughs> so I will now admit that it was Dave that wrote the opening ghost story, but I wrote the rest of the episode, I swear to God, and I made the music. It was really good. She followed up by saying, obsessed, you guys are the best in the business. Please never stop podcasting. Hell yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thanks, I get, Mandy. Wait, Jesse... You wrote, you made the music? I do all the music. Yeah. And Holy shit. So you guys, I mean, seriously, this is very impressive, you guys. And then, cool. and then. Hang on. Before chat yells it, at me. Dave, before Dave, chat, you, one second. Before chat yells at me. Yes. Seth plays guitar. So I have a brother, Seth, who plays guitar and he does play guitar on the songs. But if I don't credit Seth immediately, everyone screams at me. So yes, Seth sometimes <laughs> plays guitar on the songs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I do, I do most of the music. Yeah. Nice. And Dave, you're the VO. The what? For it depends oh, the on the episode. This, this, this particular episode I was, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we Basically, take turns. Yeah, we trade off. So whoever okay, writes the episode cool. usually does their own video and vice versa. Yeah, every week. Oh, it's cool. Different. So this one is from Jazzman over on iTunes titled Top Tier Content. Then he wrote Chef's Kiss. Just started listening to the podcast. I've been searching a while for a spooky podcast to dive deeper into the paranormal and all things spooky. This show has multiple elements that make it one of a kind. I love the intros where you listen to the lore and the story of the topic for the show. Then my favorite part is the commentary from the guys. So real and raw, not like influencers that are self-absorbed and over the top for views and likes refreshing and always greatly edited and produced. So thank not you. Not self-absorbed, huh? Uh, oh, I am. I am totally <laughs> self-absorbed. <laughs> Jesse, do you have one from uh, Spotify as well? Uh, you surprised me. So we'll get back to that after we thank our patrons. So let's jump into that real quick. For the VIPs, we have Dave D, Caden, Steve M, Blazora, Glitter Tees, Cammy from Washington, Siobhan, not Sharon, Kelly C, Jennifer P, Dakota G, Nick, Donnie N, Inspires Gaming, Allison V, Robert H. My name is Turkey Pete. I'm the king of the turkey meat. We have J9, Mallory K, Demon King, Mom and Pops, W, Lisa J, and Ugly Wuggly was a bear. Ugly Wuggly had no hair. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, being part of the VIPs. Next up, let's jump Ugly Wuggly. Ah, uh, yeah. To the uh, Warren's Wards, we have Michelle, Michelle, Team Rob. That's Please right. change that to uh, pick anyone else. <laughs> uh, Rachel G, 
Yeah, you could pick Matt. This is new. You could be Team Matt. Uh, Her Lady Spook Ship of Spookshire, Nefarious Chad Poles, Wahidi Pirate, I Hate Rob, Julie Gooley, Eugene M, Arcade Hunters, Kath Q, Bloody Blue Dress Pirate Pushes People Upstairs, <laughs> DC, Chris Connolly, LBPS Founder, Next HTGS Guest, The Other Rachel B, Sarah Cook, Stitch Kitten, Ambie Rose, Janice G, Lily, Rachel B, Roofer Dave climbs mountains in Massachusetts. <laughs> Sydney, why is the number 69 so funny to Rob Bowman? Yikes. Mm. Rob is <laughs> not going to answer that DJ. question to that child. Uh, we have Papa Squatch, six year olds driving in treetops, roofs. Steph A, <laughs> T Bone Snake Strangler. What is that? What is that <laughs> reference? <laughs> and you're telling it. Speak so many episodes. I <laughs> I've lost count, but it's Seth, so it could be anything. He just okay. keeps saying stuff. And as this list goes on, I must warn you, Matt, it, it gets more goofy. All right, everyone, block your phones. Right. Hey Siri, set a reminder on Rob's calendar that he's my favorite and not Dave. Mm. Uh, Bree, not Brianna. Chris, Miss Macab, and yes, Siri is listening to me again. Shut up. Stop it. We, we got to set a rule here for that one <laughs> every single time. Uh, Brb, got to go record the massacre in my garden. <laughs> If you know, you know, uh, Naroku, Cold Warrior, Joey B. I told myself to stop changing names, but I had to do this. Hey, Siri, search for banana ketchup near me. <laughs> I hate this. Uh, D from H-Town, Meta Oos. Oos. Okay, Sarah B. Dominica. Ice. Nope. Angel, we're setting rules. I'm not reading that one. I'll read it slowly. Ice. Wallow. Oh, boy. Come 54. <laughs> Monster Mom 04, Alley Dark Snark. They dug up a coffin at the foot of the tree inside the bar and were shocked to find out what was inside. It was Rob's neck. <laughs> <laughs> we we're all on a cliffhanger there. Megan S, Morgan S, the sixth sick sheiks, sixth sheeps sick. Fuck you, Kate. <laughs> and happy birthday <laughs> Sharon V, Wayne C, Pete the plumber eating magic frogs in a well Crystal Quinn, Aaron A, Colby has left the group <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> come back Colby uh, Rob Coakley's allegedly poor uh, viewer discretion advised Rob Coakley's allegedly poorly ketchup jizz bukkake french fry jerk up party Alicia E, thick boy Freddy allegedly poorly using the jerk up method if the Bruins see some first round ugly wuggly spookly wooglies again <laughs> that was tough was that? i had a i had a small uh heart attack in the middle of that but we figured it out <laughs> swanee we have wasting away in margaritaville is caused by the ugly wuggly sam from the paul joe r <laughs> potential purple lady ghost r <laughs> uh paul from st louis al capone i never had the ugly wugglies huggy bear went to disney world wore my htgs shirt on the haunted mansion thanks rob Love Thank it. you, uh, Brennan B. Solar Flare, Mariah M, Kira Lee J, Anthony Spiritually, I identify as Rachel BT. Add him to the list. Cody G, Brandon W, his hoop ship, her soap ship, and Captain McSlugly Wugglies gives <laughs> Hugly Wugglies to Bugly Wugglies on the Rugly Wugly. <laughs> oh, God. I, I think I aged That's three years from that list. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was going to be a tough one. I knew there was going to be a yep. lot of um, Wuggly stuff going on, on in this one. Wugglies going on there. Yes. Please stop sending Siri reminders and um, Angel. What the hell, man? <laughs> Why'd you make me say that? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't like saying that one bit. And it's not true. All right, moving real on. <laughs> I have the Spotify comments real oh, quick. Okay, go ahead. So this one's from Matthew. Um, just said, super surprised to see the video on Spotify, but really excited. It makes listening during work a bit more fun. And Miss Wolf said she was watching on Spotify. Happy Wednesday. So very yes. cool now that you can watch this on Spotify. And oh, yeah. um, give us feedback watch, on Spotify. Yeah, give us feedback on Spotify. And real quick, if you are a Patreon member, you get your side content early. This Friday's episode, we do something that's dropping early for Friday. We do something different with this one. We talk about Mel's Hole. But Jesse and Dave had no idea what we were talking about going into it. So they had to live react as I told them the story of Mel's Hole. And I thought it came out pretty funny. So make sure you go check that one if you're on Patreon. You guys will get it next week if you're not on Patreon. Hell and yeah. thanks to Regina for sending that story into us. 
Sounds cool. good. Once again, you can follow Matt Leslie on Twitter and Instagram. His socials are in the show notes as well as a quick bio if you want to look up some of the work that he's done. Matt, thank you so much for coming on. You've been an absolute delight. We appreciate you. Guys, this is a blast. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Hell yeah. And uh, absolutely. Thanks to everyone who uh, swung by and listened this Sunday. Have we announced what we're doing yet? Um, I, we can announce it. We're going to be at the Haunted Hinsdale House in New York doing an investigation. So we plan to do maybe an hour live. This is all pending working internet from there because this is Hensdale, New York, which I think is literally the middle of nowhere. I think there's about four people within a 50 mile radius. We might not have internet, so we'll see what happens. But if not, we will be dropping a Hensdale episode in the future. We're gonna be doing a full investigation and I'm really excited about it. Yeah, should be a lot of fun. So we'll be in New York for that. And like Rob said, if all things go well, we will live stream it. And for Patreon members, we're going to do a little bit of a longer live stream for you guys. So make sure you guys tune in on Sunday if it's available. But we'll keep everybody posted. So just keep up to date on the socials and we'll let people know if it's possible to live stream from there. If not, you will get footage and an episode anyways. So that will pretty much do it. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thanks again to Matt. Make sure you go check out his work and... um, Check out the, the second edition of the Winnie the Pooh movie, which uh, may or may not be on HBO Max in November. <laughs> Maybe somewhere else before then, but who knows? It'll be somewhere, yeah. Yeah, hell yeah. All right. Thank you guys so much for tuning in, and we will catch you next time. See you.